Thank you for joining us on Wednesdays. It has been a great experience. We've analyzed, we've segmented, we've priced, and we've positioned, sliced and diced, stopped the silos, gave practical advice, went all business, and leisure. We talked a lot about recovery best practices. Now it's time to put revenue management back into focus. Let us help you become future-proof hotelier. We will share our best practices and advice with you, starting from the beginning. Revenue hacks, back to basics. Revenue hacks, back to basics. Revenue hacks, back to basics. Revenue hacks, back to the basics. Revenue hacks, back to basics. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to um, Revenue Hacks, our episode maybe number eight now, I believe. Um, so today we'll talk about uh, business mix. But uh, first, maybe let me uh, introduce the, the people that we have today on the panel, if you don't know them already. Um, Olga, you want to start? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Olga Soma. I'm a Cages Revenue Manager of the Year. Uh, passionate hotelier, uh, also mentor and St. Julius Colors Committee member. And I'm Ali Northfield. Sorry, <laughs> I'll just take that one. <laughs> Ali Northfield from Revenue by Design, um, Managing Director of Revenue by Design. We provide the industry with uh, revenue management outsource solutions um, and um, basically also provide uh, training services for hotels, so training in revenue management. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Ali. I am Suzanne Williams. I'm the Revenue and Systems Director at Journey. We are a marketing agency in Cheltenham looking after luxury hotels across the world. Great, thank you. And I'm B. I'm uh, the founder of uh, MyOC, which is a, a consulting company helping hotels optimize uh, revenues. And on the background today, we have Christina. Uh, she's going to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to um, shout and she'll help or uh, send us the, the questions so we can uh, answer live. Great. Um, so maybe we're going to start with sharing um, like a little presentation of what we're going to show you um, today, if this works. Right. Okay, so a few topics today. Uh, we're going to start uh, talking about the what is actually a business mix. Um, I can tell you we struggled yesterday to find a definition. Uh, so we hope this one will, will fit. Uh, then we'll talk about how to look at the data, um, how to manage this business mix, um, looking at ancillary revenues, and then how to define targets and uh, track to optimize. So just to start uh, with a, a small definition, uh, we thought that um, business mix is actually the variety of guest types at a hotel that together uh, make up the hotel's clientele. So typically, um, a business mix might be part of uh, business travelers, leisure travelers, convention business. However, this seems quite restrictive. Uh, so the, the, the aim today is try to define that a little bit better and see whether uh, this traditional um, definition and segmentation is the right thing. So uh, business mix usually is defined by segments of the hotels. Uh, that needs to be identified and uh, you need to define your optimal business mix actually in order to, uh, to improve your business. So that leads to... Um, a question like how do we look at the data uh, maybe ali you can uh, shed some lights there 
Okay, sure. Just starting from sort of top levels, I think um, certainly the segmentation side of the business is really important um, and typically also source and channel. So there's going to be three major sets of data that you need to have in order before you can actually understand the business mix that you're achieving. Now, typically that business mix is going to be um, for any one particular day of arrival, the business mix is going to be defined by exactly what business you have chosen to accept um, from the start of the booking curve for that particular day right the way through to the the day of arrival um, and the idea is to understand the value of each of those elements of the business mix so let's say we, we talk about um, the business mix being elements of your segmentation then you need to understand the the value of um, each of those segments and given the demand that you can see from your forecast um, you then need to choose how much of each of those segments you want to accept for that particular day of arrival so there's an element of the business mix kind of being not necessarily um, at the end of um, of looking at a revenue cycle if you like but it's definitely um, the beginning of the end and the and the end of the beginning if you see what I mean so it's one of those circular things that typically um, you need to um, you need to have a handle on um, apart from segmentation typically the business mix will also be defined by channel um, and also the the type of guest or the source Beneath that, then there's there's obviously a lot of other elements that you can have a look at. So just briefly, um, you need to have an understanding of the booking window so that you can actually look at each segment um, and understand if that segment has performed to expectations to the forecast, then great. You can um, accept the level of business that you anticipated. If not, then you have to make decisions about where you're going to go next to find other um, other segments to, to su supplement that business. So booking window. Um, the um, elements such as length of stay, um, the day of week that a particular segment is likely to look at, to book, to book on, and also your cancellations. But I would say just summarizing that um, in, in the, the larger sense, um, just getting your segmentation correct, and I know we've already had a, a session on segmentation before, but getting that correct in terms of your groups versus transient, and then separating the, 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 um, those two major um, segments down into their sub-segments and then obviously being able to track them. So that's be, that would be the first way of looking at the data. Obviously, if you have a revenue management system, that's um, going to be far more easy. Um, that said, um, you can still track by segment using um, our favorite friend, Excel, at any time. We love Excel. <laughs> Is it the same way, um, Olga, are you up? Oh, maybe we can put that back. I don't know if we can maybe remove the screen. Uh... On the back, yeah. So, um, so yeah, maybe Olga, do you want to share with us the 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 way you actually uh, um, usually consider your business mix? Um, Is there no. any additional elements to that? Because that was quite uh, that was quite, quite a brief. Work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's important, as Sally said, it's to look at the specific day. Um, and yes, I would look into also the bigger picture in terms of by months um, and how it, the picture looks over the year, because we all have strategic plan. Usually ahead of, uh, when we start the year, we have the, the budget um, and it's good to understand that what we expect in every single month and how far or behind we are from that budget and then make uh, from those targets and then make uh, you know the changes accordingly uh, yeah there is uh, there is so much data you can really look into it and and the length of stay and you know purpose of stay etc um yeah so i think that's kind of additional and not necessarily i think it's total revenue management needs to be taken into account how much overall business uh, will bring because right now especially coming out of covid 19 uh the value that we allocate to the to each segment will be different and that will be actually one of the i think driving factors to to decide which which business to take or not and how to manage it effectively as well all right cool we actually already have a, a comment from uh, melissa jones thank you for for the the note uh, don't be scared to change your approach and also be scared to look at new industries uh, keep in mind the most expensive word in business is uh, uh, we have always done it that way and now it's time to think outside of the box. Is it something you've seen actually also in uh, in your uh, different experiences? Uh, people telling you, well, that's the way it is. It has to be like that, segmented, or my business mix is like this. 
Yeah, it's something what? I personally came across <coughs> as well. Sorry, Suzanne. Um, right. But again, I wasn't afraid to kind of question. I think a question status quo is always needs to be. That's what revenue function in a way is because what worked last year or even last month doesn't necessarily will work in the future. I think it's it's a constant chase, and you want to be head of the competition. And by opening it, you know, kind of the broadening your horizons and coming up with innovative decisions, that's what you want to kind of. That's where your competitive advantage will come from. You don't want to be chasing your competitors. You want to be ahead of the pack. Suzanne? I think one of the mantras that hotel managers often have is about shifting their inventory last minute. So taking into consideration, yeah, they've got a plan, they've got their market segment mixed down and everything's all, you know, as it should be from a revenue process. But when you're looking at the market segmentation, picking up on Melissa's point, at the start of the year, when you're looking at your whole accommodation strategy, you're looking at the segments, you're looking at what you want to achieve, and you're getting creative and energetic with it, I think that's a really good time to consider which direction you want your business to go in, and then make sure that in the budget that's planned in accordingly, so that you can, you're prepared to react um, as that business starts to come through, as opposed to reacting to it unexpectedly. So track in your market segments what segments too big what becomes too big to manage when do you start to see that's viable i think all those things are important but most importantly is is your pms set up to track this data because that's where we're always going to start looking how do you get your data out of your pms are your market codes correctly interesting so how do we how do we how do we actually manage to um, this uh, this business mix? What what would you do to uh, uh, communicate, control, influence? What are the uh, the, the main uh, things you'll put in place? I think your forecast is massively important. So your budget, you set your budget up and you break it all down by segment, main groups and sub-segments, and then you're forecasting daily and weekly, looking at the gaps, looking at the channels that are coming through, and then seeing what extra business is coming in, what rates and packages are producing, and looking at the whole picture holistically. I think that when you see your segments, your channels, your rates, coupled with your marketing actions, then you'll have a really good view on what's going on in your accommodation business. That, that's my view if you can track it through your system. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think to add um, to that also be, sorry, just um, in terms of understanding the business mix, if nobody's ever done it before, then um, you kind of always have to start somewhere and that can be quite a challenge um, in terms of really understanding how to look at business mix and how it can be, how it can be, um, how it can really guide and influence how you make decisions, particularly if you don't have an RMS. If you don't have a really good forecasting tool, it can be super difficult. So one of the ways that you might want to look at it is for a specific day of arrival, once you start on the booking curve is to understand, maybe take um, a day of high demand, medium demand, low demand, and if you have enough time, maybe day of week, like Monday to Friday through um, versus Saturday and Sunday, and then look at exactly what business is coming in at, and at what rate is coming in for specific segments within certain booking windows and then start to obviously calculate the sum of those revenues for each of the different booking windows and it gives you a really good idea once you get into day of arrival you can look back at each of those buckets of revenue per booking window per segment um, and and ask yourself you know did I make the right decisions for each of those um, elements of revenue if I hadn't taken perhaps the the lower as many rooms on the lower rated stay slightly further out how many rooms would I have left now for other perhaps higher rated business or higher value pieces of business um, as you come into the day of arrival so as a very simplistic start that can be in terms of looking at the data and how to do it if you haven't got a, a lot of tools at your disposal um, and particularly now when a lot of these segments are going to be disappearing you can cross-reference kind of like you know where where mm -hmm. where are we compared to where we thought we would have been um, to look at gaps if that's a help would you would you recommend people then to try and test basically to go to the what's the the uh the ultimate business mix uh by uh maybe uh, stopping the the business to come in at some point in specific segments etc because when you don't have a, a rms that is telling you that you actually need to try and test right yeah i think testing and, and also having the courage to understand um that that you need to be able to communicate that test as well. You <laughs> just um, testing without <laughs> testing without people knowing can be a bit of a dangerous business. So if you just stop something coming in, then you have you have to be able to justify what you're doing, basically. Um, but yes, definitely, definitely, yeah. But don't yeah. don't you think that that whole that whole piece means that we can um, 
use our restrictions. So if you do want to limit different segments, different rates, we can really get inventive and creative with how we put those restrictions in place and watch and test that 365 day ahead. That's where I, that's the most fun I have on a daily basis, yeah. looking at how we restrict, how we maximise, and then watching the different dates come in at a higher rate. That's the fun stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. That's, that's kind of gives it, that, that, that's the most uh, exciting part, I think, of revenue management. Mm. It's, uh, you know, yeah. you see the opportunities when you're dealing with unconstrained demand and then you, you kind of you work out, OK, where you're going to restrict availability, how you're going to do it by market segment, by room categories. Are you going to take maybe the whole entry room category mm. out and maybe release it one week prior to arrival yeah. and that maximize? Then you also can uh, yield it by, OK, room uh, rates as well. Do you, how about fence, non-fence trade, fixed trades? You know, there's um, even if we look at the corporate market segment, we have non-LRA and LRA um, managing those effectively. That is that is all key as well. But I would say, you know, you want to start, you want to keep the lead time in mind because the mice business and groups will have a, a, a longer booking window, and that's why it's important to have a historical data and, and some. If you have repeat business, will it come back next year? Keep that right in mind. Um, so that communication is also quite key there as well. I think there is a common misconception that if you increase your retail rates, your straight away, your average rate will, will increase as well. That's just mm -hmm. simply not the case. So um, there are two reasons for that. A, you might actually uh, lose some of the high rated business by being overpriced and they will go to your competitors. And second reason, you might be selling high retail rates, but actually filling your hotel with lower rated market segments and not managing it. That's where kind of that's a crucial, I think, managing business mix is one of the key elements of uh, revenue management. Great, cool. We also had a comment from uh, Monish saying that business mix changes with season. I think uh, when we were talking about day off, it's true that there's also a different seasons and uh, probably business mix is also changing throughout the time. And clearly at the moment, uh, we know that whatever business mix you had pre-COVID is probably not going to be the same post-COVID and uh, you'll have to redefine what's your optimal business mix. Right. Um, great. We have a question about Hannah also. Uh, it's all about understanding your most profitable segments per season weekdays, understanding costs and impact to the bottom line and communication of this information to all staff. Otherwise, all this knowledge will have reduced uh, value. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We touched base a little bit, but how do we manage to uh, integrate cost of distribution, cost of sales into uh, into this business mix? It's the million dollar question, isn't it, for every hotel? <laughs> I think it is. I mean, because then you think about where you put your um, commissions. Are they part of um, your rooms? Do they sit in the sales and marketing line? Where does digital marketing sit? How does the whole thing fit together? I think it really matters how you put your budget together and what the hotel wants to see in terms of conversions of profitability by department. That's, for me, I look at rooms as one p &L, and then I have food and beverage as another p &L, and that includes catering and the whole breakdowns which is fed in by rooms and then I look at all the different revenue streams so the sales and marketing line does not sit in my rooms it sits separately but I think that's a decision that the hotel takes and it, everyone's different. Um, I could add probably to that that uh, some of the market segments uh, we don't necessarily take into account the total revenue management. I think it's much easier to work mm -hmm. out if you are working on displacement, if you do your displacement analysis for group or for my business, um, that's kind of easier. But if you have, let's say, allocation contract for the next year, um, I would still run displacement analysis. I would evaluate what is the total value of that business and what is the potential, how many dates there is revenue needs to be dis will be displaced. Mm -hmm. And then highlight those dates where there is going to be some sort of spreadsheet that you're using. Um, but make sure you make a list of those dates where you, if you're accepting that contract and that allocation, where which are those dates that you will need to yield in the future and manage because you will have to say no to certain other market segments. Um, so displacement, running displacement analysis um, for the large contracts is also quite a valuable um, point as well. Um, there are some market segments that you only know with experience that, let's say, a crew business, it's a great uh, base business, but it doesn't actually bring you any F&B element into it. And that will reflect in, in, in P&L as well. And when you look at the uh, 
uh, total results per month, per year, that you will see you have a cost for running uh, breakfast, but actually you, you're not going to get guests, those guests from coming from that segment. The same applies for certain group business as well, and, and for tour series, and for any kind of fixed um, rates contracts, that's kind of what I've experienced as well. I think the only thing to add to that really in terms of cost of sale is is really understanding now um, what the additional cost of sale is in terms of, and I know you've covered it before, but the um, the uh, guest cleaning and turnaround time of rooms, um, which has been quite um, front of mind over the last few weeks. I and mean, certainly there's a there's a whole load of different um, different um, um, solutions coming out of many hotels in terms of how much time they're going to leave between um, rooms being available and that it, that fundamentally is going to impact your bottom line um, in terms of the available inventory that you have for sale at any one time so that needs to be taken into consideration certainly in the short term um, and perhaps slightly longer term than we think so yeah. I think that's a really that's really important and actually right now when we have various different conversations with various different hotels, but some hotels are saying quite categorically, you know, put our rates up because, you know, the cost of sale of servicing this business is going to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really difficult conversation to have because we don't know what's going to happen over the next three to six months with our forecasting. We've got nothing to go on. It's very zero based forecasting is a real thing and advising hotels to, um, increase the rates when we've got no idea what the demand is going to be, how the corporate business is going to perform is uh, quite tricky. So I don't know what you what you think about that. Um, if you've got any, any advice you'd throw in? I think we'll need to kind of keep in mind, I think it's a really valid point in terms of the, the cost of uh, cleanliness that will increase, but and also there is a conversation of uh, you know, removing rooms from the service for three days after the guest stayed uh, mm -hmm. as one of the ways of dealing with uh, COVID-19 and the cleanliness standards, um, you know, potentially you're losing revenue for three days. So it's it's uh, definitely an, an element to consider. But then you have, in terms of increasing rates, you have an element, okay, well, but what your competitors will be doing. We had last week discussion about, um, you know, having the right comp set. Um, and also I think it should be taken into account, you know, that... Um, if a hotel next to you is double in size or smaller than your property, um, then they will have a different strategy. So kind of pricing strategy needs to be kind of unique to each individual property, but still you need to take into account what is overall demand for the market and who you're competing and what's happening on the market overall. Yeah, and you have the end of it, I think there's uh, this kind of misperception sometimes with OTAs, oh, the cost is massive, but at the end of the day, we also need to understand where, when do we have a demand that they can, or when we have a lack of demand, actually, that they can fulfill. So it's quite important to really uh, uh, understand the business mix, not only at the macro level, but really understand uh, uh, by day of week, by season, uh, period, whatever, uh, when when the, the demand is coming from. Um, we actually had a question uh, from uh, Monish. Uh, Monish, it's great. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, there are some uh, we may not answer right now about distribution, uh, as we're going to have another topic on that. Uh, however, he's asking, if, is it the right time to um, to get an RMS right now? Uh, do, do you think in terms of system, then it could help? Or maybe if someone knows like an, an amazing cost distribution system, then feel free to share. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I'd have thought now um, is is just is the best time to get a revenue management system. Certainly, because the level of um, the level of effort involved in in really trying to get to grips with the business post COVID is going to be um, it's not really where you need to be focusing. Like your real effort should be and which should be making intelligent. Um, um, consideration of the market opportunity rather than struggling and <laughs> getting your arms around an Excel sheet. Um, there are some um, new entrants to the market that are really cost effective. Um, and so I think it's it's definitely worth shopping around. And also, whereas previously I'd have said, um, maybe look at your national players. I think there are some smaller international players now that are more than capable of, serv of servicing your business. So, you know, don't just look at, if you're in France, don't just look at French systems, but look across Europe, there's a lot of them. Um, and then you do have analytics tools. So um, Geo Analytics is one of those in terms of cost of sale, which is really worth well worth looking at. It's the one that I'm familiar with. Um, sorry, you mentioned that I could say the name of the system, so I'll just pop that. To, sorry, but that's the only <laughs> one I know. So, um, but I think um, I think 
anything that's going to, well, I'm taking a step back here, sorry, because I think that looking at how the, how management is treat is is um is looking at resource in terms of people at the moment um then i think we need to be very aware of the fact that a lot of roles are under threat at the moment and then if you and if you can provide a business with efficiencies in terms of both cost and and also um um data efficiencies and um interpretation of data i think that you are onto a really a, a good winner um that, so an RMS does all of that. So I would, I would be, I would, I would say yes. It's a great time to look for an, for an RMS, and I think there's some probably going to be some really good deals out there in the market right now as okay. well. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we we talked best about um, ancillary revenues already. Um, how how practically people can really use that, or how can we really uh, um, segment maybe ancillary revenue would you do that or do you think uh, it's something to consider but not necessarily to integrate in uh, when you think about your business mix i think it's quite um you, the point you made earlier be just about the group business and then ancillary revenue that could come from um group business but i think over the next few months when the group business and corporate are going to be kind of a bit hit and miss then looking at ancillary revenue as a whole is quite important where hotels need to get quite innovative about how they work their space can their meeting rooms be used as workspaces can you bring people through the door that way what's the niche you know what is your hotel niche is there extra packages you can put on is there arts and crafts is there paintings as a local artists i think there's a lot that you can explore and take advantage of if you understand what your USPs are, what your guests expect to see, and then how you tap into that uh, leisure demand. I think if you've got leisure demand, it's, um, there's lots of opportunities there. Yeah, I can add to that, that right now we yeah, do be... Yeah. Go ahead, Olga. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just uh, wanted to mention about the cash flow, that hotels do need to have a cash flow, and right now every single penny will um, will make a difference and whether it is we'll be converting rooms into single or one person office spaces that is a potential as well to increase revenue um, you, there are great opportunities for the for the leisure segment but as uh, Suzanne mentioned it's about how do you create that additional revenue streams whether it's going to be selling of the vouchers or something else um, also, you know, restaurants, there is a potential as well. There's right now, it's, it's very unclear when the restaurants will be allowed to open, um, but it's about really right now going all, all out and you, you want to create additional revenue, even if it's a car park, can that bring additional revenue? You know, at the end of the day, owners and businesses need to survive. So the cash flow will be kind of key here as well. Great, I agree. Yeah, I think there is a lot to, to learn from uh, from different industries, maybe, or when we look at uh, ancillary revenue, for me, one of the best example is the way a casino and hotel casino are managing their, their revenue. Um, they they took the the problem the other way around. They have bedrooms, but actually, what they want is to improve their their um, um, slot machines or stuff like that. So it's it's I think it's quite interesting, and sometimes we need to rethink. Uh, okay, what do I have, and where are my revenue streams outside of my rooms? But that can also help the rooms. There was a um, a property in the southwest that um, a big leisure property, no corporate business at all, and they really wanted to think about how they repositioned their business. So one of the things we came up with was um, art fairs. We are and they now happen four times a year, vintage and art, and we sold thousands of tickets for them. People came through the door. We set up a retail shop, an online retail space, and it just created um, a whole different energy around the business. And actually. People weren't necessarily looking for hotel stays. They came to the business to look at the retail space and that really worked well, built over the years and it's become really successful for them. So I think that you need to think a bit outside the box and be creative and innovative with how you're thinking about extra revenue. Could it be that there's a link between how the retail spaces and shopping malls had to, re to kind of reconsider their business mm -hmm. completely? Is there potential that what has started right now will go through because it's about creating the food fall and it's not necessarily will be filling your bedrooms. It's additional revenue you can generate. That's a great example, Susan. Thank you for sharing that. 
I think if it fits them in the brand, you know, it comes back to that brand creation and your whole strategy at the start of the year. What else can you do that's going to enhance your brand position, mm -hmm. generate awareness and bring people through the door for lots of different reasons? And again, you know, bringing some good energy to the business and some positivity and actually light at the end of the tunnel when, you know, we're all looking at SDR reports and feeling slightly depressed. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, certainly um, just if you look at some of the initiatives that restaurants are taking, um, the I mean, the dining experience mm -hmm. is always super important, um, always has been, always will be. The, you know, one of the reasons why people go to a restaurant is to have that, obviously, the eating experience, otherwise there wouldn't be much point. But a lot of restaurants are now redesigning, completely redesigning the restaurants, just, to, you know, just saying to themselves, how exactly can we keep this restaurant looking beautiful, but also keep within the constraints um, of, of social distancing, which is going to be around for a while, and it's just not going to disappear particularly easily or particularly quickly. Um, firstly, on the part of government regulations, and secondly, on the part of the consumer, the desire of the consumer. So there's loads of things that restaurants are doing to, um, albeit make the, um, um, the 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 number of covers is going to be smaller, but then they're saying, okay, so we just open longer, we work harder. So this is you know, this is a kind of more, more positive attitude to to how we behave. Um, and um, and I think that we, we probably need to, to look at how we use um, how we how we use our space in in the hotel just just in the, in the same way. I'm slightly cautious about office space. I just like when I'm and I and I don't know when, but maybe somebody can help me here. But if you look at something like in the UK, we have like WeWorks, which is the sort of like really funky millennial. Um, office space shared by people obviously lots of different people generally so that kind of like puts a bit of a mocker on that um but it's 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 a really nice space and and i i'm just cautious that that if you that you also have to have that that really nice space around you if, if you're going to offer an office environment so i think there's an element of you know how much do we have to invest to actually recoup that level mm -hmm. of revenue back to make sure that we are actually offering um um you know, something which is equivalent to a nice space. But I think um, I think the concept of, of formalized office space is gonna change radically. So there's obviously opportunity. I think it's just the way you do it. I don't know if any of you feel the same way, but like some boxes, I just wouldn't wanna sit in for the whole day, so. <laughs> I think the right yeah. it's about being more open door, which some brands have already done that and quite successfully actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they'll they'll be fine. They they already have the big table in the lobby, and they have a fireplace or a nice bar and cocktails, and it's switch lights at like five p.m. So that will be fine. It's more, I guess, about the more corporate ones. But to speak to a personal point of view, sometimes I like to go and work in those hotels that are pretty nice and fun, etc. But sometimes you just want to be quiet and you want to have a meeting with someone. And in this case, you may try to go into one of the uh, more um, corporate hotels, if we can sure. mention them like that. So I think I think there there is a, like, not everybody would need to go into this millennials type of uh, a business. There There is probably some opportunity for all. It's just trying to find your segment and not uh, try yeah. to attract everybody. I think that's the mistake that some people are doing sometimes. You, you try to please everybody and it just doesn't work. Yeah, fair point. The, to, sorry, you carry on, Agolka. I saw the very interesting video today about the hotel turning into bedrooms into offices, and it didn't seem like it required a lot of actually investment or high investment. Okay. And it looked really good. Um, and it was really clean and safe environment from how it came across at least. So I uh, thought that's quite creative way of, of using the bedrooms that would be otherwise into potentially. Yeah. And it I also says that you're open for business, doesn't it? If you, if yeah, it does. Yeah. It's like the spa thing, you know, if you've got a spa, you're going to attract more bookers, even though more bookers won't necessarily book and use the spa. So it's the same kind of principle. We're open for coffee, come through the door, come Correct. and see us, come in. We are all about the hospitality and it just opens up if, if you've got the space and, you know, the footfall. But I think it just says you're open for business. Yeah, and then it opportunities to sell already lunches, dinners, coffees, yeah. whatever it might be, the additional revenue then. Yeah, there's a comment from Julie, actually. Hi, Julie. Um, of uh, think that there is a product for once a week or a month for company to get together. And that's that's quite yeah. a good point because yeah, from what I've heard, so a lot of companies are actually thinking now, okay, it's working well, but we still need to get together. Like human beings are like that. But uh, so maybe that's an opportunity here to say like once a month we're meeting into this specific space, get together, et cetera. And uh, something that probably um, uh, hotels need to to look at, local business, but not uh, 
like for local people. Yeah, it came across in a few forums actually already as, a, as an idea. So there is definitely seem to be demand for that. Absolutely. Great. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say something, but you keep on cutting over me, so I'm going to give up. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. No, I'm <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was going to say to your to your point, B, um, you're right that um, there's going to be certain hotels that um, that attract a certain kind of market segment right now, and um, and and therefore getting that space to appeal to 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 like your senior mid mid level junior kind of person is going to be the right thing to do i think definitely so yeah super opportunity i'm Great. done <laughs> good so um let's see now how do we um define uh targets and maybe we can uh, uh look at the screen yeah. so i think that one of the things we were saying yesterday is not having the right business mix would be tragic uh, which was quite <laughs> uh, quite true so what, what, what do you feel about that actually? is there uh, anything you would recommend on how to define those targets and track the, those data I think usually, it, you know, it comes from the board, doesn't it? I think depending on your commercial setup, the board will say, well, I want 5% on top line revenue. Revenue managers go off and um, slice and dice your pricing and your data, as Olga would say. So yeah, I think you start with a directive and then you work backwards. You look at, that's. I think that's a preferable way to work. Otherwise, you're looking at last year, you're trying to figure out lots of different data points and then you can put something to the board and then it's just rejected and you're back to stage one again. So I think understanding what the expectations are first and foremost, then for your revenue managers to work your accommodation, work your segmentation, main groups, source, cost of acquisition, then you've got a really good place to start, making sure that your systems are set up to track do your full year forecast, look at the gap analysis, and then put your plan together. Seems nice and easy. <laughs> Done. <Yeah. laughs> Ali, do you have anything to, to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly that there is that in terms of taking directives from the from from board level and and obviously meeting targets on that level. I think there's opportunities to leverage the mix. Um, I think um, certainly moving forwards, the the likelihood is is that your your business mix is going to change and your strategies are going to change quite quickly as you move through the. Um, some people are already there, sort of moving through reopening, um, adding in extra extra bedrooms as as the as the restrictions are reduced, and then back into what we would consider to be the new normal. Um, throughout that process, there's going to be changing a change in revenue strategy very, very quickly. Um, as you as you and as you identify, visualize, and take advantage of all of the different opportunities that come up um, in terms of people booking. So, um, so yeah, I just think it's it's having that understanding understanding of how to how to leverage the mix. The mix. I think Suzanne, you mentioned yesterday also about your yieldable and non yieldable segments. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's something that we that we should really that we really do need to take into consideration in terms of. If you have got a, a hotel that typically is contracting out seventy five percent of their rooms, irrespective of COVID nineteen or whatever, um, then you know you're only left with a certain small percentage of yieldable opportunity. Um, so your business mix is what it is, um, and then trying to get out of that situation so that you have more yieldable businesses is is kind of like where you need to focus, and that's often a chat with the board as well in terms of having that commitment and the courage to do that. Yeah, okay. Well, then I that's something all... that. Yeah, but then it's something you can change for the moving forward for the following year. Mm. So it yeah. is a it does take guts, but if you have the right data and you look at it from all different angles and you have the right um, understanding and what actually and you worked at what additional revenue it will bring, then it's about influencing as well as stakeholders. Um, yeah. I think it's a, it's a decision when we're working on a budget and for well budgets, let's say and targets. That's a potential opportunity to influence some of the decisions and some targets. And if I may bring it to a little bit more like day to day, what revenue uh, directors do is at the end of the day, you you break it down into kind of chewable chunks or targets, whether it's going to be monthly targets. And then be, you review it as well as the forecast on the, on a weekly basis, slightly adjust um, and move forward. It's it's continuous cycle, I think. 
Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. key it's really to to review that and, and especially right now even more like as you said earlier, Suzanne, like we don't know what's going to happen really. Uh, so we have a rough idea because there some markets are already back, etc. We just get an example from a, like a, a quote from someone actually on the chat. Sorry, can't find it anymore, but saying that she stayed in in um in in the Netherlands and it was an amazing experience, etc. So we just need to look at those guests and like okay what do they want what how does it work and then readjust i guess your business our business mix will, will change uh corporate will not come back straight away but they will come back so when this is this time how do you readjust etc i think that that's really those plan of plus 30 90 180 360 days like how do we how are we more agile and make sure that the stakeholders or whoever um is uh, is above there how do we um how do we influence them? Oh, the quote is online now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was getting distracted by. Will's nice weekend stay in Amsterdam, and I would drifted off. We have a question from Manish. How many bar uh, rate hotels must keep? It's not necessarily sort of you know segmentation related, but it's a it's a interesting question, isn't it? It's a good one. Bar is not a mixed part. I think bar is is a um, is, is a rate type, if you want. But I wouldn't consider it as a as a like you don't talk about. Oh, my bar business is doing that because in reality, your bar business is coming from so many different sources, so many uh -huh. uh, yeah, different channels, and at different costs. That in terms of um, really segmenting, controlling your business, I would I wouldn't look at bar in that way. Can I just I'm jump sure. in there? Just one point just about that, because that's the one thing I would say to any RAFD managers watching, go and check their system, because if bar sitting in there as a market code, take it out. Take it out and change it. And equally, leisure and OTA, leisure OTA is not a segment. Leisure is a segment and OTA is a source. Cross-reference them, but don't have them as one thing. You, you want to be able to cut and dice your data and go into that granular level to see exactly what's coming from which channels. I know yeah, that's probably know. a little bit controversial, but that's my Ali, very strong view. you have something to add? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I wish, I really wish, Suzanne, you know, um, to be honest with you, um, I, I've, I have backed down on so many different um, revenue spreadsheets in terms of segmentations because OTA is sticking in there because we want to track mm. it. And I'm like, yeah, you can track it through channel. But, um, um, the I think I, I guess maybe it's because we tend to work with smaller hotels um, or perhaps hotels that aren't within brands that would be a better way of putting it um, and the resource available to them or the technology available to them just hasn't been there re really to have a look at channels in that kind of a way uh, to separate it out but you're right it should be cross reference and map um, sure. and yeah yeah I was wondering whether Manish's question is more how many bar levels hotels need to have Ooh. which is yeah. a different question and I would say to that, you need to have a, a quite a big range, and that will that will depend, you know, how what is your where's your price point and where you want to see. But you need to have some, you know, quite a lot of flexibility. It also depends where the hotel is located, what our competitors are doing, and how much leverage you need to have. Sometimes it could be five pound difference, could it be twenty five, could be fifty. It also bar levels maybe depending on on the seasons as well. Um, so I, I was wondering whether that maybe question is more about the bar levels. And yeah. also el elastic pricing, I think, is important as well. Yeah. You can chuck that into, you know, which levels go where. You know, I always start with an elastic pricing model just to get the client and the hotel comfortable that we're not going to be way off scale with tweaking and adjusting that dynamic pricing model. So we push and push and push. So we can start off with quite a few different levels and then we amalgamate them down just to give comfort and confidence that we're not going to annihilate their business and we never do yeah good yeah different systems are doing different ways also i think if it's mm. more about how you um how you want to position your 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 brand and uh and if if you want to go to the nitty gritty level of even sense or stuff like that which i personally don't like but i know that some budget companies for example would make a, it would make a big difference so there's not a, a right answer to this one monish i'm afraid um great well uh 
intense session. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're coming to the Can end. Can we keep going? Can we keep going? Let's keep talking about this. Uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask. If we have an answer, then uh, put it on the on the on the comments on LinkedIn or wherever you're watching us, and we'll uh, reply afterwards. This is a huge topic. I think we can never get to the end of it and never get a, a, a right answer, but hopefully we um, we shed some lights here for you today. Um, thank you very much, ladies, for uh, joining me to this session. Uh, for the ones listening tomorrow, we're talking about racial diversity in hospitality leadership. It's a great one uh, to follow tomorrow. And next week with Revenue Hacks, we're gonna talk about pricing. Um, so we hope to see you there next week. Thank you.